Sup dudes, it's Quam. Using this intro instead of the Asian man intro because I want to say that, you know, if you guys attempt to do this, you should probably know a little bit about what the fuck you're doing and do some research before you attempt it because it could be dangerous. You could fuck up your firearm, you could shoot yourself or make your shit dangerous. If it's a carry gun and you drop it by accident, putting it into your holster or pulling your pants down to drop a deuce, you don't want the thing to go off accidentally because there's not positive enough engagement on the sear or something like that. I'm going to do a quick series of videos on trigger jobs, trigger parameters, and shit like that. I don't really see this kind of information out there on YouTube. Usually you see dudes doing trigger jobs and they just do a polish job or just change out springs and shit. And to me, that's not a full trigger job. I am not a gunsmith. I'm just some dude that happens to know a couple of things and I'd like to share my knowledge because I like to advocate people doing their own shit. You know, I do all my own motorcycle work and fix my car myself and shit like that, fix my plumbing. Even if you don't do the work yourself, you should at least understand how these things function. This is my opinion. If you're gonna attempt to do this, you do it at your own risk. <laughs> you know, this is just for knowledge, just for education only. Alright, so part one of the anatomy of a trigger job is going to be uh, stages of the trigger. So you can see what the individual five stages are and how they affect your trigger pull and accuracy and how you can change them. Some people don't think the reset's all that important. Uh, some people do. Personally, I like having as short a reset as possible. As little creep as I can put into it while still being reliable. Uh, and as little over travel as possible. And of course you want the brake to be... With most of my guns they're like carry guns and combat pistols and shit like that so I like to have a, uh, what uh, Mr. Geisley from Geisley Automatics calls a, a carrot-like brake versus an icicle-like brake which is what you would want on like a long-range uh, precision rifle. Um, this is the Walther PPQ from the factory. It comes with a pretty badass trigger. I need some better lighting over here. So you can see here, and you might have seen this already on some of my other videos, this is all called take up, right? The amount that the trigger travels before it touches the sear. In my opinion, it's not very important whether you have a lot of take up or a little take up. Some people can't stand having a lot of take up and they need to have that reduced. Okay, take up, and then the break is when the sear actually disengages from the hammer or the striker and then immediately following that is over travel and that's how much the tr trigger travels past the break point before you get to the break you're gonna have creep but this firearm does not have very much creep you see that it just it just breaks very crisp and clean and does not have very much over travel once the triggers back the gun cycles and then you're gonna have reset which is how much distance the trigger has to travel before it disconnects or it's gonna be disconnected before it reconnects with the sear Break, very little over travel, gun cycles, and then you have reset, which is very short on the Walther PPQ. From there, you have take up back to sear, which on this gun again is like I think a tenth of an inch. Very little. Break, a creep, break, and over travel. It's hard to see the creep because there's very, very little in this particular firearm. Reset, take up back to sear. Break and over travel. You can see the reset is extremely long on this particular firearm. This is the H and K P30. I've done a trigger job on this, so the factory trigger has a little bit less take up, a lot more creep, less crisp of a break, and a lot more over travel. But as you can see, since I've trigger jobbed it, the creep break and over travel is minimal. Okay. And then you have the gun cycles, and the reset is. Uh, tremendously long on this thing. And even that, I've reduced the reset on this particular firearm by about 40% from factory. So the stock gun has a, <clears throat> a lot of creep, a lot of over travel, and a lot of reset. But as I've said in other videos, the, <laughs> this thing is a combat pistol. It's not a precision, you know, range gun, competition range gun. This is my Marlin 336. This gun has no take up, very little creep, a good break, but it has a little bit more over travel than the other ones. You see how far that thing traveled. And with lever actions, you're not going to have a reset, right? The hammer, as you can see, hammer cannot cock until you release the trigger. Release the trigger, and now the hammer can cock. Okay? 
No take up. Nope. Very little creep. A good clean brake, but a decent amount of over travel. See how far the trigger travels from the brake point. Now the AR-15 from the factory, without any trigger dropping, <clears throat> is going to have a fair amount of creep. So, no take up at all on this particular uh, AR-15. Most AR-15s don't have very much take up. But the creep is fairly long. You can't really see it, you can feel it. And the gun cycles, and then you have reset. Which again is, I'm trying to get this thing focused here. Not too long on this, but it's, see all this movement here? This is as far as the trigger has to move the sear before it breaks. And then it has a decent amount of over travel too. Gun cycles, reset, creep, break, and over travel. So for a little bit more detail, like I said before, I don't really feel like take up is all that important. Um, some people don't like it. If you're doing a, oh shit, pull my gun out and have to defend myself type of trigger pull, and that's going to make your finger have to swing a pretty long way because you're not really stopping at the sear and pressing through the sear like a precision shot. You're just yanking the gun out and pulling the trigger as hard as you can because your fucking adrenaline's up. Um, so in, in that respect, yes, the uh, pre-travel or take up um, being long might be disadvantageous. Uh, but for taking long range precision shots, you know, you're assuming that if you're pulling the gun and just yank yanking on the trigger like that, that it's going to be fairly cr close range. If you're taking a long range shot, then the, the take up is not going to be quite as important. The creep, though, is always important, especially for long range shots. If you pull the trigger to the point where it touches the sear and it takes uh, a considerable amount of movement of that trigger before the sear breaks, then um, that's all input you're putting into the firearm. The mo most accurate possible shot with a gun is going to be one that you don't have to put any input into the, the trigger. If you could just say, fire, you know, just hold the gun still and just tell it to fire vocally, then that would be the most <laughs> accurate trigger possible. The anatomy of your fingers. No matter how you hold the gun, your finger is pivoting at your joints. And you need to be able to pull that trigger straight back in line with the bore. Because the finger has to pivot, it's making small arcs at each pivot joint. And you can kind of articulate your fingers to where you're pulling straight back if you're conscious about it. But you see you have to be able to move three of these joints uh, independently. So people that like to fire their gun with a trigger in the nook are robbing themselves of articulation. So it's going to make it harder for them to pull that trigger straight back because now they've pretty much isolated it to where you're... Um, big knuckle there is really the only thing that's pulling. So you're you're pulling the trigger back in an arc, and it's going to put input into the firearm, especially with a pistol, and make your rounds go most likely low right. A lot of people go low left too. Um, so in order to better articulate that, you want to use the pad of your finger. You want to let your knuckle, that big knuckle I was talking about, come off the firearm. You, you want to put a gap there. And go like this so that you can pull the trigger straight back. If you have a lot of creep, then that's more input you're putting into the gun, left or right. You know, unless you have a perfect trigger pull. Having more creep is less forgiving uh, when it comes to accuracy. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a perfect trigger pull if you reduce a lot of the creep. Same thing with over travel. As the bullet is leaving, as the bullet is traveling down the barrel, if your, your trigger finger is continuing to swing in that line, in an arc, because your fingers articulate in an arcs, then you're continuing to put input into the firearm. If you have very little over travel, then the trigger's going to stop moving after it breaks and make your shots more accurate because there's going to be less dynamic of a movement of your trigger finger. It's a very short throw on the trigger. And reset. Some people think it's good, some people think it's bad, some people just don't care because they're gonna, they have bad follow through or something like that, you know, and they just release the trigger. Like once you, once you pull the trigger, you want to hold that trigger back and then the gun will cycle and then you reset. A lot of people that don't really know how to take precision shots with a pistol, and this is the same thing with, for, for rifle too. 
if you are just going this, you're affecting the trigger and affecting the muzzle uh, adversely. You want to try to put as little input into the gun as possible, so when you pull the trigger, you hold it back as the gun cycles, get your sight picture back, and then you release to the reset. Alright, this one here is probably the best trigger I've ever felt. Uh, the double action, you can't really see it, but man, it's glass smooth. Like butter. And very light. The single action, you can see no take up, no creep, clean break, very little over travel. I mean, that is the finest single action pull I've ever pulled. It's about, what, two, two pounds? Two and a half pounds, right? Mm. Alright, here we've got a high point 9mm, and you can see here that there's very little take up on it. But this is a good example of creep. There's a lot of creep. I'm going to try to do this slower so you can see how much creep there is. So, here we're talking about single action only uh, trigger systems here. Uh, double actions are different. The trigger bar catches the hammer you know, from the hammer down position and as you're pulling the trigger, the trigger bar is pulling the hammer from the down position all the way back to the full cock position and then releasing in uh, one pull. So all of this talk about sears and creep and over travel and shit like that, that's uh, in reference to a single action pull. Everybody talks about creep as if it's just this terrible thing you gotta take all of it out. So that's true, true to an extent, but you have to have some amount of creep uh, in order for a firearm to be safe. If your full cock notch in your hammer is very shallow and there's very little real estate for the sear to make purchase on it, right, because you've taken so much of the creep out, then it's going to make the thing unsafe. You could have a slide follow, uh, you can have doubles and things like that. You know, usually your firing pin safety and the other safeties in the firearm are going to prevent that from happening, but uh, either way, like if it's a double single or hammer fired, uh, then that hammer might follow the slide forward uh, if there's not enough creep. You, you know, you have to have some amount of engagement surface uh, for the thing to be reliable and safe and for the gun to function the exact same way every time and the trigger to feel the exact same way every time. And, uh, there's also a sort of in-between uh, that's striker fire pistols. Are Glock single action or are they double action? Because uh, a Glock, uh, an XD, uh, an MMP, and I think the SR Series 2 from Ruger, they are 60% cock. The striker is not fully cocked all the way. Um, the PPQ, on the other hand, it's the only striker fire pistol that I know of that is 100% cocked striker. So it has a true single action trigger. But Glocks, MMPs, and uh, all these other striker fire pistols uh, do not cock the striker fully and completely. Uh, but they're not a true double action either. I, mean, I consider a Glock to be pretty much a single action. I think Ipsic considers it to be a double action. Knowing the, the way that the internal trigger group works, uh, everything about it looks exactly like a single action you know it's just that when you pull the trigger the sear you could think of it as having a very positive engagement angle because every pistol or rifle for the most part now there are a few exceptions the PPQ has a neutral sear engagement but for the most part most of them are going to have a positive engagement angle that means that uh, every trigger that you pull for the most part is going to cock the hammer or striker slightly forward. This is for safety. That way the striker can't fall you know, or slip or you know, get bumped off of the sear. Uh, it needs to be positive. That means that it's going to have to, in order for the, the, the hammer or striker to bypass the sear when you pull the trigger, it's going to have to be cocked slightly forward. That way the spring tension of the striker or the hammer is pressing itself against the sear. Uh, in my opinion, a Glock or an MMP is basically just a single action trigger with a very positive sear engagement to the point where it has to cock <laughs> the striker 40% more of its uh, full travel. Uh, hopefully you guys learned something from this video. Uh, I'm going to try to make, I think, three more in this series, The Anatomy of a Trigger Job. Uh, so, subscribe and stay tuned.